Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. You know, if you watch that video, he says, this is, I changed my, I can't do stitch voice. This is my family. <laughs> we do what we can. We only do Kermit well. We don't do the other people. Miss Piggy. Hey, Miss Piggy. Anyway, um, but you know, when Stitch says, this is my family, and he says, it's broken, but still good. You know, we watch that video clip and we watch her fight for possession of him for, because she's accepted him. You know, in life, Everyone, everyone wants to feel accepted and loved. And there's lots of people, you know, I told a story about somebody, and I'll tell it again today, but the truth is there's lots of people who've never felt accepted. They've never felt accepted for who they are, really who they are, and so they're afraid, so they hide, so they pretend, so they, so they put on airs, so they pretend they're somebody or not, or they attack other people because they've never felt accepted. And here's what I believe, and, and I hope today, here's what I hope to do today with this sermon. I hope that you'll just get a taste of how much God loves and accepts you. Because I believe if you could just see, if, if somehow you could stand on God's side and look through his eyes as he looks at you and got a glimpse of how much he loves you and how much he accepts you, that your insecurities, a lot of your baggage, the way we treat other people, a lot of that would go away because we would realize how much God loves us and it would help us to love other people. That's why Paul said, I hope that you will grasp how wide and how deep is the love of Christ. And so how much God loves and accepts you. Because we've all played kickball as kids where they chose teams. And we've all stood on the sideline. And if we were chosen early, we stood on the side watching kids get chosen and feeling bad for the one or two kids that we knew would get chosen last. Or even worse, some of us were the one or two kids that got chosen last. But no matter whether it's kickball or something else, in life often we feel like that. We feel like if people really knew me, who would want me? If people really understood me and they knew that I had a mental illness or they knew I had a physical issue or they knew the hurt I had or they knew the habit I had, they would not want me. God wouldn't want me. We even try to hide it from God like Adam and Eve, like somehow we can hide anything from God because we feel like he doesn't accept us. And here's what's awesome. We're going to talk about shape today again. But we're going to talk about shape, and this is the idea of your spiritual gifts, your heart, your abilities, your personality, your experiences, in understanding that it's God that made you who you are. So the areas you struggle in are not a surprise to God. Your, your strengths and your weaknesses are probably the same thing. Those of you who are outspoken also can be jerks, but you're outspoken, so you can also speak up. Those of you who are shy and caring can also get hurt. Our strengths and our weaknesses are the same. God knows that, and so God made you who you are, but here's the awesome part. He loves you, he accepts you, and he wants to help you to love and accept others. Jesus prayed for the early church, for the disciples, that we would know the love of Christ and that others would see God's love through us, that they would see it through us. So let me talk about what shape, and we're going to look at how, what it reminds us of, and then look at how we can apply that to other people. So shape reminds me, number one, I've been accepted by God. Now, all of you will nod when I say that. I've been accepted by God. But the truth is, in your heart of hearts... You have a caveat. You say, God accepts me, but, or God accepts me when I'm good, or God accepts me when I behave, or God accepts me except for this area of my life. God accepts me except for my failures. God accepts me except for the dumb things that I think and do. God accepts, listen, no, no. listen to what this verse says. Romans 15, 7. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. This word here for accept is the idea of bringing you closer, of pulling you in. You know one the other thing we fear and we and we deal with people. I, as a pastor I deal with this with people all the time. 
There are people who close, 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 close. I don't do what they want. Rejection. If you're in leadership or you're a boss, that'll happen to you too. You'll do what people want to. Oh, we love you. We think you're the best boss. Oh, you didn't do what I want you to do. I hate your guts. And so we think that's how God loves us because that's the kind of love we see. So as a church pastor over the years, 25 years, I cannot tell you the number of people who were my biggest fans until they didn't get their way. And then they said, oh, you can't believe what that pastor did. He was so mean to me. I was the one who used to whatever. And now, and you go, what happened? People reject you. But God will never reject you. Some of you were rejected by your own families. Some of you were rejected by friends. Some of you were rejected by a spouse. Some of you were rejected by everyone. Some of you couldn't even get the dog to play with you. I mean, you've been rejected. You understand rejection. And yet, God says, I accept you. I accept you. See, Paul was dealing in this chapter, Romans chapter 15, he was dealing with uh, uh, Gentiles who became Christians. And they weren't obeying the same rules that the Jews were. They weren't getting circumcised. They were eating shrimp still. They were having cheeseburgers. I mean, there were things. That's, by the way, that's true. That's some of the things. If you're a, a strict Jew, you don't eat cheeseburgers or shrimp. And some of you are like, and, and you know bacon. You know the story about bacon, right? Okay, so these guys are still eating bacon. And so the Gentiles come to church, and they feel like we're not as good as those Jewish people who do all those good things. And then there were Jews in the church that felt like we're better than those Gentiles who don't do the things we do. And Paul looks at the early church and he says, hey, hey, Jew or Gentile, male or female, Port St. Johnian or Titus Villian, <laughs> accept one another as Christ accepted you. Do you think you're better than somebody else? Do you think that someone else is better than you? Hey, get over it. Get over it. God accepts you, not because of anything you do, but when you trust Jesus Christ, we all become a part of a big family. And if you're Italian, you become a part of a big family. And you better behave. You've been drawn into the family, so you become a part, even if you're broken, even if you're messed up. So here's what I want you to do. Number one, your first challenge for today is this. Thank God for accepting you. And you don't do that because you feel that way. You do it by faith. God, thank you that you accept me. God, I don't feel very acceptable. God, so-and-so didn't accept me. But you accept me. Number two, not only does your shape remind you that you've been accepted, your shape reminds you that you were created with a purpose. You are all different than one another. Aren't you grateful? Aren't you grateful? Just take your hand and put it next to somebody's hand that's next to you and notice how different you are than the person next to you. I know it's a weird thing. If you're a dude, you can just put it on the chair or you can just kind of do this. Like, okay, I'm going to pretend I'm not really done. But, but just your hand alone, not to mention everything you do and who you are and how your pinky alone is totally different than the pinky next to you. That's how different you are. It's amazing that we can get along at all. Because not only are you different in here, you're different in here. Some of you are very different in here, right? Right, right? Some of you are like, God, we're thankful that we're not as different as Pastor Eric. We're very grateful. But listen to this. Listen to this verse. And, and for those of you who grew up with low self-esteem, I, I want you to put this verse on your wall. For we are God's handiwork. And this word handiwork is such an awesome Greek word. It's the idea of being stitched together. Stitch, get it? Okay, stitched together by God. It's the idea that God put you together. God gave you a personality. He gave you experiences. He allowed things in your life and he made you and he will even use the horrible things in your life for good. So it says we're God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. But Eric, you don't understand. I'm not like you. I don't, I don't stand on the stage and preach. That's not the only good work. By the way, most of the good work that will happen does not happen today. 
Most of the good work that's going to happen is when you go to your classroom, when you go to your cubicle, when you go to the place where you work, when you greet people, when you say hi to your family at home, the way you greet your family, the way you say goodbye to your family, the times that you could get angry and you choose not to, the times that you could say something sarcastic. Are you listening back there? And you choose not to. Although there are times when it's funny, so... But there's times when you can be sarcastic to be mean. You know what I'm talking about. And those times when you have that giftedness that you choose to say, you know what, but I'm God's handiwork and I'm here to do good works. But Eric, you don't understand. I've messed up. I've blown it. I'm a broken person. Yes. Most of the Old and New Testament, well, all the Old and New Testament is written by broken people. But most, much of it was written by murderers. It was written by people who were super broken. Just so that God could show that he can use anyone. So here's your second challenge. Every day when you wake up, remember, I'm God's handiwork. And I have a purpose. No matter how you feel, no matter what your emotions are, no matter what happened in your life, no matter what happened yesterday, no matter what happened that night, no matter how good a night's sleep you got, no matter how bad your dreams were, no matter how you felt, no matter whether you have sleep apnea or not, no matter what happens, you have been weaved together by God and you have a purpose. And so when you're discouraged and when you're depressed, I want to encourage you to remember that God still has a purpose for you. So your shape reminds you you've been accepted, that you were created with a purpose, and then that you no longer work for the accuser. I'll be honest with you. I've been in church a long time. My pastor, when I was a kid, used to say this, and I never understood it. And I'm sure it made the leadership in the church mad. But I think it's the, so true. He said, he said, Satan sends his best people to churches and leadership. Now, I don't know if he was looking at one of the deacons when he said that. I'm not sure. I will say a couple of deacons did leave the church not long ago. But anyway, but, but the truth is that, listen, there are accusers. And listen, there are people who are Christians. They're well-meaning, loving people who love Jesus. But they have those old habits from the accuser. And so they tend to accuse other people. And, and some are looking in the mirror and accusing themselves all the time. And they sense that accusation all the time. Listen to what it says in Revelation that's going to happen. So when you hear the accusations, you can remember who that's from. For the accuser, by the way, the idea of accuser is, is somebody here in the Greek that takes you to the middle of town to show everybody your fault. Remember, they brought the woman caught in adultery in the middle of town, threw her in front of Jesus. The accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God. Listen, listen. Day and night. The enemy hates your guts. He, he accuses you day and night. I mean, ACD thieves thought it was great to have a highway to hell. But let me tell you, it's a miserable place. Although it's a great song. Am I allowed to say that in church? There was a song called Highway to Heaven that was much better. But it never became very popular. Anyway. Day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed, that's the word, overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they didn't love their lives so much as to shrink from death. See, when you're being attacked by the accuser, you know what happens? You lose hope. When you're being attacked by the accuser, you forget seeing that there's any purpose to your life. That's exactly what he wants. And when you, listen, and if Satan can't do it inside of you, he will send people to do it outside of you. People will come up to you and say, you're no good. People who come up to you and say, you can't do that. How are you going to do that? I mean, you know, you've blown it too much. You've messed up too much. Eh, who do you think you are? By the way, I've been literally told, who do you think you are? <laughs> I'm like, uh, Eric. Which is not the answer they wanted. They weren't very happy with that answer. <laughs> Eric Brooken, who do you think I am? Is there a mental illness issue? I don't know. September's mental illness month. I don't know if you knew that. We'll talk about that. I'll probably talk about it. What's important? Let, let me tell you something that's important. It's really true. Listen, there is mental illness in the church. And I want you to know, if you struggle, we love you. And we're here for you. And we accept you. My father struggled with mental illness. We didn't even know it until he took his own life. But the truth is, listen, you have an accuser that will tell you if you struggle mentally that you're not as good as these people who don't. 
Others of you struggle with other things. Maybe you struggle physically with losing weight or something else. And the enemy will come and tell you, oh, you're no good. You're lousy. Look at you. Look at that person next to you. And get you comparing your mind or get you comparing your body or get you comparing your looks or get you comparing anything to make you feel like you can't do anything. That's all he wants to do because he wants you to quit. But you have been accepted. No longer do you have to try to achieve to please God. He loves you. See, if we went to the YMCA today, and if we went there today together, and we did that, they would kick us out. But if we went to the YMCA together, and we were all swimming, and we were sitting by the pool, we were swimming, and I look out, and Neil's swimming, and all of a sudden, Neil gets a cramp. Ah, cramp! Ah, and he starts, help! And he starts saying, I'm driving. Help. And the pretty lifeguard jumps in, which I think is the reason that he pretended to have a cramp. But I just, you know, I don't want to question Neil. But so he fakes a cramp. Anyway, so so anyway, so he acts like she pulls him out of the water, puts him on the side of the pool, right, and makes sure he's okay. And he's okay. If all of a sudden Neil on the side of the pool started saying, "I'm drowning," we would then begin to think there's an issue that has nothing to do with the pool, right? We would think, why? Why do you feel like you're drowning? Here's the truth. Jesus came and he saved you from your sin. Jesus came and saved you from accusation. And he said, you are mine. I love you. You are holy. You are righteous. Not because you did anything, but because I pulled you out of that. And I put you on the shore of my grace. And yet we still say, now how am I going to please God? How am I going to please God? Oh, now I have to figure out how to please God. I got to do something for him. I got to please him. I got to make him happy. Listen, he absolutely loves you. Quit trying to swing. Sin in his grace. God is not accusing you. So when you hear accusation, here's your next challenge. When you hear accusation, say, that's not God. Now, that doesn't mean conviction. Conviction and accusation, two different things. We'll talk about that in a minute. So we're accepted, created with a purpose, no longer work for the accuser, and you can use your shape to bless anyone. God has given you gifts. He's given you spiritual gifts. He's given you a heart. He's given you abilities. He has made you to be able to influence others. It says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, bless you. Give him something to drink. In doing, that's not in here. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil. Listen, but overcome evil with good. And let me give you the summary of this verse. We usually look at this and go, well, I'm supposed to be nice to people who are mean. No, no. Ready? Bigger, bigger, big picture. Your micro, big. Ready? If you're supposed to love... If you're supposed to bless, if you're supposed to do something for somebody who is your worst enemy, then you should constantly be looking to be a blessing to people, not only who are your enemies, but people who are your friends. When's the last time you woke up in the morning and said, how can I bless someone today? When's the last time you were headed to work and you said, God, today, would you show me a way to use my gifts to be a blessing to somebody else? And let me tell you something about God. If you get a little quiet, which is hard for me, if you get a little still, then you'll be on the way somewhere and you pray that prayer. And all of a sudden, it's not like God's going to go, here's what I want you to do. But you'll be somewhere and you'll go, you know, I could help so-and-so this way. That's God talking to you. It's not audible. He's not, hello. How about test one, two? Right? But you'll all of a sudden get an impression. Hey, I noticed this person need, and I have that. God can use you. So that's your next challenge this week as you go in. As you go into work, as you go home, as you wake up in the morning. Maybe you have a relative who you struggle with. The next time you're forced to get together with them. Think, how can I be a blessing? All right, now I want to point out these things. I'm not going to talk through all of them, but just real quick. So what acceptance doesn't mean, this is from the book of Isaiah, acceptance doesn't mean that saying that evil is good. So accepting somebody doesn't say, we, well, listen, I think it's great that you're an alcoholic and a drug addict, and I just think that's awesome, okay? So accepting somebody doesn't mean you accept their behavior. It doesn't mean you say that something bad in their life is good, but you can accept a person Remember, the woman caught in adultery, thrown at Jesus' feet. You know what he said to her? Where are your accusers? And she looked around, nowhere. And he said, I don't accuse you either. Some of us still play the role of the people with the rocks. They're actually rocks. 
And sometimes the rock we throw is at ourselves. Don't call evil good. But it doesn't mean saying evil is good to accept somebody. <clears throat> it also doesn't mean to accept injustice or cruelty. So if you see a bully, you don't just say, well, I accept that bully. Just do whatever you want. No, no. You step up. That means in life. It means with the government. It means with everything else. That's why as Christians, we should rise up sometimes and say, hey, that's not right. That shouldn't happen that way. That's not just. It's not allowing others to abuse or violate our boundaries, which we'll be talking about in a few weeks in boundaries. And acceptance doesn't mean the Bible isn't the standard. Accepting someone doesn't mean to say, oh, I just think that what you do is great. Or, yeah, I agree. I think there's many paths to God. Jesus is the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And every once in a while somebody will say to me, Eric, that's really narrow. And I go, hey, it's not my rules. Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. If it was up to me, I would say me, but that's not it. And I would tell you what you need to do for me in order to, right, right? But I don't make the rules. That's the good news. So how can I accept and confront? Because there's times you can accept somebody, but you still need to confront them. If you, listen, if you have children, this is your life right here. This is, if you have children, this is what you do. You, you first of all, check for selfish motives. Sometimes as parents, we only discipline or are aggravated. Sometimes as people, we only confront other people when they irritate us, and then we confront them. That's not good. Better to not say anything than to say it in anger. Make sure you don't feel superior to another person. Most of the time when we confront or we do what we call church discipline, we do it because we feel like we've got to have control and we're arrogant, we're superior to them. Recognize the grace given to you when you correct someone else. Confront privately in love. This is probably one of the biggest mistakes, not only in church, but in business. And confront with others when it's needed. And then don't attack character. This is huge for you as parents and grandparents. Don't attack their character. Deal with specific behavior. So when I was a child, you know, I'd be bouncing off the wall. And my dad could have easily, or my mom especially, was a better disciplinarian. So my mom could have easily come in and said, you are such a doofus. Right? Instead, she said, Eric, quit hitting the wall. She dealt with the behavior. She didn't assassinate the character. Too many of us, when we deal with other people, we instantly take them out. Instead of just dealing with the issue, we deal with all of them. We, we basically say, rejected. So let's look. Now that we know the benefits of our shape, knowing that God has accepted, created, and we no longer work for the accuser, how can you now accept yourself and accept other people? When I was in elementary school, I switched schools in sixth grade. So I'd only been in school a month. Went to a fair in Miami. There was probably 50,000 people at this youth fair. And we went into a haunted house. I probably shouldn't tell you that part, right? And, and as we went into it, it was on a spiral staircase. And Sally Isaacs was holding my hand. By the way, I was so dumb, I didn't realize she liked me. Prettiest girl in the class. Dumbest kid in the class. Okay? So we're going up the stairs. This group in front of us pushes back and she goes over the rail. I grabbed her and pulled her back up and back onto the stairs. Oh, right? Now, once again, I'm so clueless. Sally Isaacs writing me notes. She's looking at me during class. I have no clue. End of the year, Sally Isaacs comes up to me. Here's what she says I just want you to know. Her big blue eyes. I just want you to know, I used to like you, but I don't anymore. <laughs> that's, that's, I went home for summer with that. Miserable Atari-filled summer. If you, that's an Atari. That's, Atari, they didn't have a joint, they just had one and a thumb. That's all you, okay, sorry. Helping the young people out here. So, so how do you, when you deal with rejection like that, when you deal with somebody in your life who pushes against, how do you then feel accepted? First of all, know and receive the truth from God's word. If you've been here any length of time, you will notice that about once a year, I put a bunch of verses and I say, this is the truth about you. You know why? Because we forget the truth about us. God's word was written and inspired by God. There were 40 different authors on three continents, and it took almost 2,000 years, and yet the theme is the same. If you look at any other religious book, it's written by one person about their own thing. And of course, they can keep the theme the same. It's them. 
The Bible has the theme of God's redemption and his love for you all throughout Scripture. And so here's a few of them. Christ has accepted me. I'm a child of God. I'm a part of the true vine. I'm Christ's friend. I'm chosen and appointed, justified, redeemed, at peace with God. I've been freed from sin's power, slaves of righteousness, dead to the law, free from condemnation. I'm a son of God, an heir. I'm holy, sanctified. I have the mind of Christ. <gasps> the one in me is greater than the one in the world. And you did great to keep up. we got to give that to awesome there. So... You may need to take this list and put it somewhere and read it every day if you really struggle with feeling accepted by God. Some of you need to put this in your car. Some of you need to read it to your children. Some of you should put it on the dining room table and every night read one of these. Put it somewhere that can remind you what God says about you. And here's the other thing. Spend time in God's Word. If you're not having a quiet time, I want to encourage you, even if it's just five minutes, not in the car, Get your Bible. You can, we have the Daily Bread out front. There's an app for the Daily Bread. They will even read it to you. You can push play and they'll say, Today on Daily Bread. Hey. Right? And they'll read the scripture to you. You don't have to do anything but listen. But I encourage you, get still for a few minutes every day and let God pour his word into you. Because here's the deal. If you watch any TV, they want to fill you with hate and fear. Because that's what sells. So if you watch any TV right now, the news guys are loving that there's a hurricane. If there was a hurricane anywhere in the world, they want to act like it's coming here. Because they want you to be afraid. They want you to be scared. Why? Because you'll watch it. Just do the same thing over and over. Because we love fear. And the Bible says, hey, perfect love casts out all fear. So as you start to receive God's love and cast that out. So spend time, allow God through his Holy Spirit to speak to you as you read his word. Number two, not only to accept yourself and receive God's word, remember that Jesus died for everyone. That will give you a different look at people. God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, not when you had it together, not when you did something good, not when you came to church, not when you got it right, not when you gave some money, not when you did something smart, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we not only receive truth from God's word and remember that Jesus died, we walk in the promise that God has saved us. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and with your mouth you profess your faith and are saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So have you done this? If you've done this, you need to remember that you're saved by grace. And because you've been saved by grace, you need to give other people grace. People who are broken and messed up. You don't have to accept what they're doing. If somebody's an alcoholic, you can love them. You do not have to give them a dime. You can accept them. They'll say you don't when you don't do what they want. But you can accept them and care about them and yet not help them in their addiction to be more addicted. You've been given grace. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's the idea that when I put my faith in him, that he saves me. Years ago, I had a friend named Colin when I first started in youth ministry. And Neil remembers him. And we would gather and, and I, would, I would tell Colin, I'd be like, you know, I struggled in this, I struggled in that. And Colin would always say, man, but you're doing a great job. Man, you're just coming off. And Colin was one of these people that when you got around him, it didn't hurt that he looked like Jesus. He had long hair and he's tall. He wasn't perfect, by the way. At his wedding, he read his wife's vows. <laughs> so he's like, I will be loyal to you, Colin. I mean, he's reading his own. It was bad. But he would say, you can do it. You're accepted. You're doing a great job. You're there. And, and you felt accepted around him. Do you know anyone like that? I want to encourage you Christians. Be that person. Not the person who says that evil is good, but the person that says, I love you no matter where you're at or what is happening in your life. I care about you and I accept you. We should be a church that accepts and loves people. We don't love their sin. We don't love the brokenness, the things that they do. We don't love it when they fail, but we love them even in their failure. Why? Because Jesus loved us in our failure. And if you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, I'll be here after the service and you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Jesus. No matter how broken you are, we're still family. So I encourage you to accept one another. God made you who you are. He loves you and he accepts you. And my hope is as a church that we can love 
and accept other people. Let's go to Lord in prayer today. Father, I know for me, often, I forget, and I, I don't always see how much you accept me. You don't just love me, but you accept me. And Father, sometimes I don't feel very acceptable, and yet you accept me. And Father, I know here, there's so many who feel far from you, and yet you say when we call on your name, we're saved, and you accept us. And so, Father, we receive that acceptance today. I pray if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that today would be the day they receive your acceptance. Lord, I pray as we give our tithes and we give our offerings and we give our money to you, I pray that today, Father, we would realize as we give, it's not to be accepted by you, but it's because you accept us that we feel free to give. So, Father, we choose to give this morning with a warm heart and a loving heart, not because we're earning our way to you, but we're thankful for what you've done. Father, praise the church, we would be so full of love, so full of acceptance that your spirit would move here in a mighty way. Not because we have it together, but because you're good. Thank you for being so good to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Have our time of offering now. You give what God's put on your heart. Thanks for being here this morning.